Hello all, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Revati. Let me tell you why I'm here. When I was doing my MSc, I had the interest in doing research and for that I had to write UGC net exam. And after few attempts, I could crack JRF with 68%. And while doing so, I uh, had a thought because hardly I could find any YouTube videos for forensic science. So I thought, why should we not start any such thing? So that's why I'm here to help you people in cracking UGC net exam. Now, let us start with the unit 1 itself that is introduction to forensic science before that let us see the contents that we are going to study today first what's forensic science the scope forensic history pioneers involved in them finally forensic ethics firstly what is forensic science as we all know, it is applying the scientific techniques in the criminal justice system. The word forensic has derived from the Latin word forensis, which means forum. That is nothing but court. This itself tells us that we apply the scientific knowledge to prove in the court to link the suspect and the crime scene. Next, coming to the scope. Here, forensic science has various specialities, but here we'll just discuss the major ones. Firstly, forensic biology, which includes the study of plants and animal materials that we encounter in the crime scene. Whereas, serology is the study of serum and other body fluids that we come across in the crime scene. Next is forensic anthropology. This is the important branch where we uh, study about the personal identification, especially in cases of decomposed body, it is very hard to determine the person. So for that, we do the body measurements, especially the skeletal remains are measured. The person who interpret in this way are called as physical anthropologist. This involves the body measurements by age, stature, would help us in actually identifying the person. Next, forensic medicine. Here where you apply the medicine and the science in solving the legal problems. Here the doctors who are certified with forensic pathology only can perform the post-mortem examination. The bodies that are being bought by the police, this is done to know the cause of death. Especially like uh, in cases where to know whether it is suicide or homicide or any other accidental case. Then coming to forensic odontology. Here it is the study of dentition, teeth arrangements. Here also the dentist should be specialized in forensic aspect. Then only he can become a forensic odontologist. So, why do we study about the uh, teeth arrangement and how does it help? Yeah, in especially mass disasters, the teeth pulp helps uh, in getting the DNA uh, because sometimes the tissue DNA gets degraded. And even the unique arrangement of teeth in uh, IS would also help us in uh, detecting or identifying the person. But you can better understand the role of odontology with a case study called Ted Bundy Serial Killer Case. The actual Ted's name is Theodore Robert Bundy, an American serial killer who kidnapped, raped and murdered young women and girls in around 1970s. But then he got confessed that he made 30 homicides in a span of 14 years, that is from 1964 to 1978. Though he could confess for 30 homicides, but it is not yet confirmed. Initially, when he was doing few murders, 
firstly he got convicted and was put in jail but then he somehow escaped and went to florida and after 3 weeks of his escape he murdered again a 12 year old girl and fortunately when he s- drove a stolen vehicle he was arrested and when police investigated the crime they could find some evidences including the bite marks on the victim and so on still ted bundy was so confident that he could somehow come over with the murder charges by acting himself as his own attorney but then his confidence shattered by a forensic odontologist who told that he could match the bite mark on the victim to that of the bunter's front teeth and ultimately he was executed in 1989 and died of electrocution this is how a forensic odontology can help us in solving even a serial killer case next coming to forensic chemistry and forensic toxicology under forensic chemistry we'll be studying about the chemicals that are involved maybe in uh, the crime like especially maybe pesticides or any kind of chemicals and even uh, arson cases deliberate firing would also come under chemistry and mainly this deals with the study of uh, drug related crimes like drug addiction overdosage of drug doping in sports all this will be studying under the forensic chemistry coming to forensic toxicology it is the uh, study of poisons like uh, the deaths that are occurring because of poisons we'll be studying the mechanisms and the effects of poison once it enter the body and what are the effects of different poison and how to treat these poisons by using antidotes and so on so next coming to criminalistics this is the study of trace evidences like fiber hair soil paint and so on here oh, the people who do these interpretations are called as criminologist this is a broad subdivision of all of the other scopes or the other subjects this will be studying in detail in our coming videos next going to question document question document we come across the documents of that we have like the currency the passport the property documents we will be seeing whether the document is original or that is counterfeited by using some techniques like maybe analytical technique or any other uh, comparative techniques that we would be using example handwriting comparison in case of suicidal note or uh, signatures whether it is forged or not and so on next coming to firearm and tool marks the study of firearm is called forensic ballistics especially in uh, forensic aspect here we study about the mechanism of a particular firearm and what does it do once it reaches the target what are the effects that it causes the target and how are they been exhaled out the bullets or whatever is exhaled out coming to tool mark examination this will be studying about a tool mark that is a mark that is unique mark left by a particular tool by this in many cases like burglary robbery in all these cases we can just link like by linking the mark to that of the tool and linking the tool to that of the owner that is a suspect maybe and so that we can identify the actual culprit so next coming to fingerprint examination fingerprint examination is something we know the fingerprint patterns that we have is unique no two fingerprints of the same person matches right they are not identical even with our own fingers so that's what they are called as infallible signs because they are unique they cannot be uh, 
wrong like the prints that are present is present it cannot uh, tell give a wrong information of other person it is there in our examination because of its coming it has reduced the scope of anthropology next moving on to the history part here when we date back to 3000 bc the first instance of autopsy has taken place in egyptian civilization this they have done as a religious practice because uh, to know once the person dies they do it as a religious practice but there is no any official cause but officially the autopsy has been performed in 44 bc this was done by a roman physician named antistuvus who has examined the body of a roman politician and the general julius caesar here when he examined he could reveal 23 stabbings but out of those only one wound has caused them die so by this because of the post-mortem examination we could reveal the actual cause of death right next we'll date back to 13th century where the person named song shi who is of judge or forensic medicinist in uh, China. Here he published a book called Shi Yun Jilu, which means the washing away of wrongs. This is the first written testimony that has been written in forensic science to solve crime using medicine and entomological technique. That is to tell as an example a case study. The first case study that has been recorded. Uh, there were a murder that has happened in a village. So the investigator, the Song Si, he uh, started collecting the details. When seeing the uh, body, he could see a, a weapon mark in the neck. And that weapon was a sickle. He could find that and uh, so he told the villagers to put all their sickles in front of them. To his surprise, he could see the insects were attracted to one particular sickle. And on examination, he could see that there were unseen blood particles that were recognized by the insect. And because of this, the sickle owner was investigated and at last he was confessed of committing the murder and this is how he had written his techniques of how to use medicine and entomology in solving the crime coming back to the 17th century here the two Italian surgeons named Fortunato Fidelis and Paolo Zacchia observed that there were changes that has occurred in a body because of some disease and by this, they have created the basic foundation for modern pathology. What is pathology it is nothing but the study of organs by which we can know the cause of death. Now, coming to the pioneers. Firstly, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He is none other than the fictitious character Sherlock Holmes. As with his character, he popularized the crime detection methods that made us all keen. Like as we had inspired by him, even the scientists got inspired. Few of them are Han Gross and Lockhart Ekman. His first novel is The Study in Scarlet in the year 1877. And he had mentioned so many detection methods that was a root to forensic science. Next, Carl Wilhelm Skeel. He is a Swedish chemist who was first to develop chemical tests to detect the arsenic chemical in the corpse, that is the dead bodies, in the year 1773. Next, coming to Matthew Orfila who is considered as the father of modern toxicology because he was the one to firstly publish a paper on poisons in the year 1814 when he was 20 years old itself and the name of the treatise is Traité du Poison which is written in French which means Treaty of Poisons. 
Here he explained the determination of poisons and their effects on animals. It is important to note that uh, the paper that he has published is written in French because previously there, have be there was a question asked that uh, the treatise that is written by Orphila is in which language, whether it is in Spain or French or German. Because he is native, he has born in Spain, but then for his studies, he came to France and continued his work. So, the paper that he has written is in French. Then, coming to Alphonse Bertillon. In the year 1879, he developed a system of method for identification of suspects and criminals. And this is called anthropometry or Bertinolage. This includes 11 body measurements that would help us in identifying the suspect. Because of this contribution, he was considered as the father of criminal identification. Next, Sir Francis Galton. He initially started collecting thumbprints in the year 1888. Later, he was credited for developing the first classification system for fingerprints. Then, in the year 1892, he published a book called Fingerprints. This was the source for knowing how to use fingerprint in criminal identification. This also included the basic patterns of loop, arch and wall. Coming to Kelvin Goddard. He has played a major role in forensic ballistics. He explained that how to determine whether a particular gun has been fired a bullet or not. What he did was he compared the bullet that has been emitted from the suspect's weapon and to that of the test fired bullet with the help of comparison microscope. Coming to Karl Landsteiner, as we all know, in the year 1901, he described method to determine the blood group with the help of fresh blood. But then in our crime scene, we won't always find the fresh blood, right? We mostly find the dried blood stains. So for that, here came the Dr. Leonie Leitz, who was a professor in the Institute of Medicine at University of Turin, Italy. He, in the year 1915, has determined the blood group from dried blood stain. Next, coming to Albert Osborne. He created fundamental principles in document examination, which was solely responsible for the acceptance of documents as a scientific evidence in the court and in the year 1910 he also authored a book called question documents this was considered as a primary reference for document examiners now coming to hangross he was the one who coined the term criminalistics and was the first one in the year 1893 to publish the textbook in forensic science which titled handbook for investigation and system of criminalistic in the austrian language but later he published the same in english with the title criminal investigation in this book he has mentioned what are all the applications of scientific disciplines in the field of criminal investigation. Later, he also introduced forensic journal named Archive for Criminal Anthropology and Criminalistic. This still it is supporting as a medium in the method for scientific crime detection. Though Gross explained the scientific applications in theoretical way, but practically it was followed by a scientist named Edmund Lockard. He, in the year 1910, established 
Lyons Police Department in France. Later, he was famous for his principle named Locut's Exchange Principle, which explains us that a person who is coming in contact with object or a person may have some transfer of material within them. And this concept is explained with the help of an example, a case that has actually happened. There were uh, counterfeit coins that were presented to him and three suspects. He then urged the police officers to present their clothes in his laboratory. When on examination, he could find small metallic particles stuck to the clothings of the suspect. Later on identifying the metals, he could find the same similar structure of metal in that of coin and the suspect's cloth. And this is how he explained the local exchange principle. This is happening in our daily life too. See for example, just you walk on a garden, you there will be a transfer of pollens on your shirt or your dress, right? Now, coming to forensic ethics. What is an ethic? It is nothing but dealing with the values that are related to human conduct. It is just telling that whether we are doing a right or wrong in simple way. So this is what we come across in our daily life too. But in case of forensic view, the forensic ethic, ethic is something which we apply the moral values in the criminal justice system. In forensic science, ethics plays a very important role because if there is any unethical thing happening, then it will directly affect the fates of those that are involved in the criminal case, right? So that's the reason we should be very cautious in forensic science too. The main problem is that involvement of more humans. Because of that, the more number of malpractice or negligence would happen. So starting from the collection of evidence till the interpretation of data, there should be a serious care and precaution to be taken to get a good result to avoid any unethical thing that is happening. Now, we'll see types of ethics. Under that, basic minimal ethics. This is something that is very important, like it is a basic requirement that is needed. And if there is anything, any change in that, it may directly lead to violation of ethic, leading to an unethical act. Whereas aspirational ethic is something where you, uh, a forensic scientist tries to reach a good state, like uh, to improve the standards to uh, inculcate more and more analytical techniques so that you get better result coming to code of ethics this tells us that one should not provide any wrong degree or any fake area of expertise and one should not wrongly provide any data that is taken as an expert opinion Coming to major hindrances in forensic science. Firstly, professional credentials. As I told you, faking the educational qualifications or giving an expertise qualification in areas where they don't even have a proper knowledge. So, for example, I can tell a case where a police forensic expert in West Virginia named Fred Salim Zain has uh, been working for a de decade but then he used to provide false results to hundreds of criminal cases in a convincing way so that he can gain the favor of the judges and juries so that they don't cross-examine him and slowly he increased the later by providing results that he haven't even conducted any test so Ultimately, he turned up the case itself and at last he was caught and was convicted for all his problem and before his conviction itself, he was 
dead so this is how because of his mistake there are hundreds to thousands of criminals life who has been ruined right next laboratory analytical procedures where especially in case of dry labbing they say that uh, give the procedures that they haven't done at all or giving insufficient analysis uh, some cases like uh, doing in uh, only few analysis which is not sufficient at all to give a particular result so even that can misinterpret or else indiscriminate analysis where uh, doing something uh, wrong like if you don't have any part good knowledge on particular analysis giving a wrong uh, analysis will also misinterpret right another thing is interpretation of analytical data especially confirmational or contextual bias like where you don't know the full objective or you don't work to the full objective can lead to confirmational bias or giving a wrong terminology may also mislead the case itself right that leading to contextual bias as paul kirk has rightly told that physical evidence cannot be wrong it is in us how we look for the evidence and how we interpret the evidence after analysis so finally concluding that in court they are highly influenced with the forensic evidence and the expert testimony so we have to be ethical the forensic scientists should be very concerned in providing the result we should have a record starting from collection of the evidence till the interpretation like a chain of custody so that we can minimize the unethical issues finally ending up with the court nobody can go back and start a new beginning but anyone can start today and make a new ending so even now we can start preparing and crack your exam thank you for watching till the end if you like the video kindly put a like subscribe and comment for more and more videos